So recently, we had the tremendous pleasure and the honor of welcoming the US Cambodian novelist Vadi Ratna to my class Human Rights in History at the Department of History at McMaster University. We found that the novelist Vadi Ratna was extremely collegial in agreeing to spend so much time with her, for which we are extremely thankful. The novelist Vadi Ratna was just five years old when the Khmer Rouge came to power in Cambodia in 1975. After four years of living under the genocidal regime of the Khmer Rouge, when she was forced to endure forced labor, starvation, and near execution, she and her mother escaped, while many of her family members perished, murdered by the Khmer Rouge. She comes from Cambodia's royal family, the Sisovat. Her father was Prince Sisovat Ayurwan. In 1981, she arrived in the United States as a refugee, not knowing English. And in 1990, she went on to graduate as her high school graduating class as a valedictorian. She is summer cum laude graduate of Cornell University, where she specialized in Southeast Asian history and literature. In recent years, she's traveled to Cambodia and Southeast Asia, writing and researching which culminated in her novel, her, in fact, it was her first novel, In the Shadow of the Banyan. The New York Times best-selling novel is being translated into 15 languages. And she lives in Maryland. And she spoke to us by Skype uh, from her home in Maryland. And, you know, we could, we could capture her live in our classroom in Hamilton. In 2009, she visited Cambodia with her husband, Dr. Blake Ratner, where they met the former king, Norodom Sihanouk, and they actually contributed uh, three tons of rice for the Cambodian people. She says memorable things like, we cannot be motivated to prevent future atrocities if we understand nothing of what has been lost in the past. And she writes things like, and especially, uh, you know, in reference to her novel, she writes things like, I did not want the voice of atrocity to be bigger than the voice of humanity. So her novel, her first novel in the shadow of the Banyan was, uh, has won many awards and recognition and much recognition. Uh, it, it was the Historical Novel Society's uh, editor's pick it has been a New York Times bestseller. It has been a New York Times book review, editor's choice. It has been an, a finalist for the 2013 Penn Hemingway Award. It has been a Christian Science Monitor 10 Best Fiction Books of 2012. It has been People's Magazine's People's Pick, a Goodread uh, Choice Awards 2012 Fiction nominee, Newsweek Daily Beast, Hot Read Selection, The Oprah Magazine, Summer Reading List Selection, Parade Magazines, Parade Pick, and Amazon Best Books of the Month Editor's Pick. So once again, before I give you uh, the novelist Vadi Ratna, I'd just once more like to thank her for her enthusiasm and for having engaged so uh, willingly and so, so in such an erudite fashion with my students in the course Human Rights in History. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so at this stage, let me begin the proceedings by asking the first question. And that is, was it difficult for you to confront the past when you began writing? to try and remember and reconstruct the past that you lived through? And secondly, as a writer, how do you use memory, especially in order to construct history? Well, um, to answer your first question, it was excruciating to, um, not only to confront the past, but uh, to, for in my case, to, to live with it on 
uh, I feel on a daily basis. And writing was for me a form of um, trying to find um, a peaceful way of, of addressing that past, of um, coming uh, to, to terms with it. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, for me, I think uh, it was more than just a, a, a retrospect um, looking back to something that already happened, I feel that that experience so marked me as, as a child that um, I can still very much uh, access it. Um, okay, I, I will, basically. Um, I'm sorry, again, what is your second question? The second was, uh, as a writer, how do you use memory? Yes. Especially in order to construct history. Is it is it a difficult process of recovering memory? Yes, um, it's uh, like I said, uh, it's, it's uh, more than just a memory. It's, a, it's something that I feel um, uh, the experience continues to, to stay with me, to live with me. But, you know, memory, depending on your mood at a particular uh, uh, moment in, 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 in your day or what you're going through um, uh, with your experience, your current experience. So memory can can be um, can be at times un uh, times unreliable, and therefore um, I feel that I needed to fortify my memories of uh, the, that experience with um, a strong uh, historical understanding of, of what really happened, that's when um, I uh, felt that, that my background, my studies uh, at Cornell really helped me. Um, I, you know, I remembered um, things in the way uh, I tried uh, remember things with a, a, acute um, emotional clarity. But emotional clarity is, uh, is not enough in, in writing this story. It's a story that's based on a real historical events, a, a very uh, a, um, specific political event um, in, in Southeast Asia, in, in Cambodia. And therefore, I needed to go back to the historical documents, the, the journalistic um, uh, records to really um, uh, gather the facts uh, to reinforce uh, my memories uh, of that time. Thank you very much. I, I think we overlooked one part of the program, which was to get an opening comment from you. Okay. Well, I think I, I, thought, I thought so, but I didn't want to... Um, right. Uh, to, to interrupt, you know, our, our dialogue, but that's okay. So, well, would you like to do that now before we move to the questions? Back a little bit. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Mita, for including me in this conversation with um, your class for selecting my novel as a topic of discussion. And uh, thank you to mm -hmm. each and every one of you um, for taking the time to read The Shadow of the Banyan and uh, reflect upon the significance for this broader theme of human rights in today's world. Um, before responding to uh, further questions, I thought um, it might be useful to locate myself a bit by way of introduction. I am not, uh, of course, a scholar of human rights. I am one among millions who survived the Karuch regime in Cambodia. I could very well have perished, like so many uh, members um, of my family. The fact of my survival creates a duty and a responsibility to bear witness, not just to really chronicle the atrocities, but critically important to me to honor the lives of those lost, to give expression to their dignity. 
their courage and sacrifices their voices. I believe strongly that um, we cannot feel motivated to protect others' basic human rights if we cannot identify at some fundamental level with their humanity, the ability to see oneself in another's place is an intellectual exercise. It is a necessary human emotion, a feeling we must cultivate through our understanding and awareness of others' lives, their endeavors and struggles. In other words, empathy, I believe, is a human requisite. For me, this is one of the vital, vital functions of art today. It offers us the possibility of crossing boundaries to empathize with others whom we do not know firsthand. Personally, writing in the shadow of the banyan, I was very aware that many readers would uh, know very little of Cambodia and its history. And thus, I had little reason to expect that so many would come to identify with the story of Randy, this um, young girl in a small country living through war and revolution that occurred over three decades ago, events that are understood at the time and to many largely forgotten. One of uh, the more readable historical accounts of the war in Cambodia is called The Sideshow by the journalist William Shawcross. His title is very apt for it. It describes how Cambodia and its people became collateral damage from the war in Vietnam, including the secret bombing campaign authorized by President Richard Nixon that left hundreds of thousands of civilians dead and millions and displaced. It's um, astounding to think that such destruction could be conducted um, in secrecy, but uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, took advantage of this and was able to seize upon the chaos to expand their insurgency against uh, the U.S. backed government, eventually taking power in 1975. They promptly expelled um, foreigners, cut off most international ties, and began to implement a radical vision of their society outside the view of the international media and largely outside the consciousness of the international public. The fear of human rights advocacy has grown tremendously since that time, and one of its functions precisely to bring light to these shadows. The dark places were not only tyrants and warlords, but also governments of all types inflict sufferings with the expectation that no one will know or even care. I have a great deal of respect and gratitude for those who make it their work to document and stand up against human rights abuses and to prevent their widespread their, their spread often um, at great personal risk. Um, their commitment gives me tremendous hope. The growth of human rights activism, despite the backlash this incurs in so many places, is also a sign that there is indeed something universal in these principles declared in the wake of um, World War II when the terror of uh, destruction so fresh in the minds of those who gathered in the early moments of the United Nations. Recently, um, I received news that in the shadow of the band will be translated into Turkish, the 17th language so far. As I uh, look at the list, which includes uh, German, as you mentioned, um, Dr. Mita, French, Italian, Japanese, um, Czech, Slovak, Polish, Hungarian, and Hebrew, I am at once uh, amazed and humbled to think that such a diversity of people would be drawn to this story. I am also struck by the realization that these are all societies like my own, defined by war and revolution in living memory. I began writing as a very personal, intensely private journey 
um, small step we could say in trying to reconcile with the past uh, with all that, uh, that I did not understand. I never imagined uh, that it would connect me to so many and now it has uh, brought me to you. So thank you once again for having me and I would love to hear your thoughts and questions. Thank you so much. And with this uh, we invite our first questioner <laughs> to please come and ask the question. Thank you. Hi there. Hello. I'm Aelia, by the way. I'm sorry, you're in here? Aelia. Aelia. Okay. So my question is regarding the genocide in particular and specifically the ways in which we talk about it. Um, so terminology is incredibly important when it comes to the, to the discussion of human rights and their violations. Um, and they often have to be approved by institutions of power, such as the U UN. Otherwise, they remain you know, unused in official documentation, and thus the impact of what happened in a specific place is lost. Um, so my question is, has, it, has the genocide in Cambodia ever been referred to using less severe terminology, such as civil conflict? And if it has, what impact has that had on the reactions of the international community and worldwide? Well, you know, in the case of Cambodia, scholars um, still, are still debating whether they classify the Khmer Rouge period as a genocide. Um, racial and ethnic um, element, uh, uh, the, the racial and ethnic element was, uh, is the only um, uh, one part of it. Certainly, um, uh, one of the definitions of, of um, genocide is the involvement of uh, the systematic mass killing, which is the, in the case of Cambodia, and um, evidence, clear evidence um, of crimes against humanity on a huge scale. And that, of course, has been established by um, the, 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 the scholars who've been documenting the, uh, the mass graves and the methods of killings and so forth in uh, during that period. Um, for, for myself, I um, more uh, often refer to it as the Cambodian um, tragedy. I don't really, um, I'm very cautious <laughs> as a writer to even refer to what happened as genocide. I, I, I do avoid it. I try to avoid it as much as I can. Uh, in my own writing, in, in my own discussion, I initiate the discussion. Um, and I avoid a phrase, um, a phrase like uh, the killing fields as well, because uh, phrases like genocide, killing fields, um, because it has been so um, clearly uh, defined in certain, um, uh, with certain terminologies, um, the people, when you speak of, of, in, in these terms, uh, you do bring your own preconceptions uh, to, to, to the experience. And then before making comparison to other cases, to, to other um, uh, mass atrocities, um, I as a writer want people to understand this experience in its own right. Um, you know, in Cambodia, we do have the translation now um, for uh, for the word genocide. It's um, and Cambodians do use them, especially those uh, scholars or researchers. Um, but I think it's still a very much um, debated, uh, uh, I guess, a terminology in, in the Cambodian situation. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. It's nice talking to you. <laughs> it's a very good question. Hi, I'm Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Hi. Um, my question pertains more to racism and racist ideologies. Mm -hmm. So, um, it is in your novel, you touched on the racism taking place between the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese people. Um, yes. Can you sorry? Um, can you elaborate on their animosity and what effects, if any, it had on you and your family? Yes. Um, uh, as uh, 
uh, one of the uh, interesting essays noted that, uh, and you yourself, racial element was a, a, a strong part of the Khmerouche ideology, especially um, to the end of the regime when the, the need to purge from the, the party became so strong. Um, the uh, attacks were uh, uh, mostly what I witnessed uh, as a child on the ethnic Vietnamese and Chinese. Uh, the irony of that was that the Vietnamese and the Chinese uh, states uh, supported the Khmer Rouge movement early on, um, the, especially during the underground period in the, the early, um, uh, in the late uh, the 1960s and early 1970s. Other elements um, I didn't emphasize, um, including attacks on the Jiang, uh, the, the Muslim minority in Cambodia. Um, the, uh, and I didn't emphasize because I didn't encounter um, uh, directly, I only heard about it. Um, what was, I thought what was curious, um, even as a child, going through that experience was that even though uh, race was used as the, the point of uh, uh, the reason for attack, for attacking a particular group, um, when the the kind of Rouge regime became the uh, most paranoid, race uh, was not based on any real foundation. You know, um, uh, there was no document saying that. You know. The, a person is uh, has declared himself or herself Vietnamese or Chinese. It was all projected um, in terms of what your race was by the your your attackers. The you know the Khmerouche leadership decided or uh, the soldier decided. Well, you look Vietnamese, so therefore you must be Vietnamese. You have light skin, so you are different from the ethnic mine who has um, more, you know, darker skin, therefore you're an enemy. And it, it, it um, went on to mannerism. It became just as an excuse, I think, to attack uh, potential enemies as the party um, leadership, the core leadership, uh, became more and more paranoid and more fearful um, of the threat. Uh, to its power, and I think you know that's that's the root of uh, a lot of racism. It's just out of extreme fear and ignorance. Um, so <laughs> uh, I think in that case, um, uh, the racism of the Khmerish tradition is not very different from the racism that you witness um, uh, elsewhere. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, well, I'm starting to get nervous. This is very uh, smart. <laughs> <laughs>
still um, relegate women to uh, uh, as a secondary place. In the novel, the roles of uh, Bong Sok, or rather Sok, the one of the um, uh, the Gamakuba, the, the town uh, leaders, and his wife, when he uh, and his wife called Rangi and her mother forward, um, I wanted to really uh, paint um, a clear tension between the two, you know, the, the, the spouses. Uh, she wanted to, to have um, to have equal footing in questioning these two potential uh, enemies, and he seemed to treat her in the way that Cambodian men often um, uh, treated women who was, you know, your role is to go get water for them and, and, and receive that micro list question. Um, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of the hierarchy of leadership, the women were designated um, as head of the kitchen, head of the communal mess, head of the various committees concerning domestic uh, duties. Uh, and one other clear distinction also uh, during the Khmer Rouge uh, is in the, the marriage arena. A soldier could go ask the town leadership uh, for a, for a wife and to request a particular woman, but um, a woman could not do that. A woman could not say, you know, I really like the soldier, can I marry him? <laughs> um, you know, that he could, she couldn't uh, ask that of, of the town leadership or the faceless organization. Um, this experience is actually very different uh, uh, from the communist movement in Vietnam. Um, and for, I think, a woman having spent some uh, research time at Cornell University uh, in Vietnam looking at the role of women in, uh, in their revolutionary endeavors uh, during the, the periods of the 1930s when they were fighting against French colonialism, the role of women was on a much more equal footing um, with men um, than, uh, you know, uh, as compared to, to women. In terms of your question, um, had, would it have been different for me had I been a prince? Well, you know, my, my father was a prince and he lost his life. And I don't know how he would interpret it, this statistic. After four years of the Khmer Rouge, the society was mostly a society of women. The men were killed. So it's, 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 a, it's a regime, I feel, full of contradictions. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank yes. you. Um, focus primarily on ideology. Yes. And I noticed um, throughout the novel there's several examples that you highlight of um, Khmer Rouge foot soldiers displaying um, a decidedly ignorant stance towards the uh, rhetoric of the Khmer Rouge itself. Um, so is this a specific focus of your novel or um, was it intentional or, and if so, why? Well, you know, um, you have to understand the society before the Khmer Rouge. It was predominantly a literate society in the sense of 80 some percent of um, the uh, people of, of, of the peasant were, but did not know how to, to write. And um, so much of the uh, of the Marxist uh, ideology of the communist or socialist, whatever, uh, you know, whatever, however you define the Khmer Rouge, um, was uh, force fed um, to uh, these um, illiterate young soldiers, and it became something of just uh, chanting uh, slogans and, and, and rhetoric. And, and so um, you have to wonder how much 
of what these young ignorant soldiers are saying is um, something that they, they really understand. Um, uh, versus if you compare uh, to, to China or um, uh, Vietnam, the way the uh, Marxism uh, or communism took root in those two societies began with the kind of massive education of the population first. The Vietnamese uh, and Chinese were taught by their respective leaders to read and write uh, first. And, um, uh, and then uh, they were given the propaganda. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, in, in China, you have the great leap forward, and, and you have you had a lot of of, of um, killings and, and, and suffering as well. So, um, what was I think disturbing in the Cambodian situation was the belief that um, what matters is this uh, determination toward building uh, a utopia that it is uh, uh, um, it justifies any amount of violence along the way. And um, young soldiers were, were, were used to, to, to carry that violence forward. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Katrina. I'm sorry, what's your name? Katrina. Katrina. Um, I have a question regarding the current Cambodian tribunals that are going on. Um, so in the past few months, the tribunal has been teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Yes. And in the past uh, week, actually, all of the translators and interpreters have gone on strike. So obviously this has stopped everything. Um, and I was reading that the chief prosecutors are now campaigning around Europe, trying to get European countries to donate money. I was wondering, in your opinion, um, what case should these people be making to European countries as to why they should care enough about the tribunal to donate money? And also, in your opinion, are there any other challenges facing the tribunal? Gosh. Tribunal is a very, very contested area right now. And you know, when, when I was living in Cambodia from 2004 to 2009, um, I, you, you had the sense so much of it uh, was uh, politicized and so much of it was, um, uh, if, if not corrupted, questionable. <laughs> in terms of its procedures. Um, uh, you know, I have always felt that in the Cambodian situation, the Cambodian tragedy, um, the first tragedy is uh, itself the, the, the sufferings uh, of those four years, the deaths of um, nearly two million people. And the second tragedy is that um, the tribunal um, comes uh, some 30 years later. I think in terms of making the case for the tribunal to, to um, an international community, um, and I, uh, I, 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 I would be a little bit wary of making the case to just European country. It needs to be an international community that examines uh, the worthiness of this. For me, I believe that the tribunal is important in terms of establishing some um, form of public accountability for um, the perpetrators of, of these crimes. I think uh, that is, is really important and for Cambodians to see how the rule of law is, um, is being applied uh, and, and how the, the process of the court works and so forth. 
but, but the accountability is paramount with the tribunal. At the same time, I find that um, what is critical is that the tribunal alone is not a substitute for a society's self-atonement and reconciliation. Atonement and reconciliation needs to come from within the society itself. And that I feel that atonement and reconciliation has to proceed almost the tribunal. I feel that Cambodians, we as Cambodians have not faced this tragedy in a way that occurred in, 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 in the sense of looking into the mirror, of looking and asking ourselves, what are we personally responsible for? Whether we see ourselves victims or perpetrators or somewhere in between, I think that question needs to be asked. What I feel is a bit ambivalent is that the tribunal is pushed from a direction that is very politicized, very political, and it, it's, I feel that it's almost a push to receive, to, uh, to achieve a certain political agenda. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Hello, Ms. Ratner. Uh, Hello. My name is Daniela. How are you doing today? How are you? I'm okay, thank you. Um, in the novel, we saw Rami experience many changes in terms of her relationships, dreams, and expectations. So our question is, um, did your personal life change as quickly and as drastically as it did for Rami? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I had a very protective childhood. It was a childhood the way I described it that was almost um, like this uh, total institution, total paradise where everything was um, created for, for, for our sense of peace and our sense of enjoyment. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't, as a, as a child, I didn't realize that somebody like my father was struggling with his own um, background, with actually the foundation of his, his own privilege. He was part of that generation that went abroad to study and became enamored with the ideas of democracy, of a much more progressive um, society. And he came back after his years of study abroad, after being exposed to art and literature, to the world, you know, you have all that too in Cambodia, but I think, you know, when you step outside of your own um, society and experience another's um, society, you learn so much more. Your world, your view is, is broadened. And that's what happened to my father. But I felt when he came back to Cambodia, it was within that environment that I painted at the beginning of the book where the relationship was very um, uh, uh, hierarchical and, and you know, your role um, is prescribed for you, where you fit in in the, in the scheme of things. Um, but you know, I was not too aware of my own privilege as um, in the sense of uh, uh, you know, I was aware of it, I, I was, but I didn't question it in, in, to the level that I think I, I would have, uh, you know, I question it now, and I would have questioned it had I still um, uh, had that life. Um, and uh, what I saw um, that was different was this, before the Khmer Rouge came in, Everywhere we went, there was an assertion of who we are. You know, the streets were named after our family, the schools, and so forth. 
after the conversion came in, everything about us had to be hidden. Um, you know, we had to hide our name, we had to hide our identity, we had to wipe uh, our past uh, completely. So, yes, it was a, a, a drastic <laughs> change, to say the least. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin, and Kevin. Uh, my book, I mean, my question is about the book as a document. And uh, how would you define a book as a genre? Do you think it's a book about human rights? Oh, wow. Um, you know, as, as a writer, as an artist, when you set out to attempt a piece of art, the, the last thing you want is to have it defined, uh, be defined, it's so, uh, uh, I guess, uh, limitedly. Um, uh, I, you know, various people have, uh, have called this novel various things. Um, they, um, some, the idea has been called a historical novel. Um, which to me is, is really strange because I feel like what I'm describing is not really history in the sense of, you know, I just came back from London and we went to see, um, we went to the, the palace of uh, King Henry VIII. You know, when I think of history, I think of that. Um, something that belonged far into the past and, you know, a uh, king can't get away with it, uh, you know, uh, good. Uh, executing, decapitating his wife, <laughs> anymore. And but you know the, the atrocities that I, I describe in my book has the potential of recurring again. And I still feel that you know looking uh, at the world today, seeing one revolution after another, the, the atrocities uh, that uh, are being committed. It is something that still. Uh, it is something that is still recurring, like, uh, and and to call it historical, a uh, historical novel is, uh, I think, is a misnomer. And to call it a book about human rights alone is um, uh, is a misnomer because when when um, when I set out to write, I wanted to to tackle so many themes and I want it to be a work that is as layered as possible. Um, I want each person reading this book to find the inspiration that he or she is looking for. And um, it's been, for me, it's been really gratifying to um, see, to, to receive uh, letters from, from readers from all walks of life identifying with it. I have received a letter from um, a pilot who, who was um, in the Vietnam War, and he said he flew over 300 missions over my country. Uh, basically, he was a bomber. And there was this connection between myself and him that we were even though we were on the, uh, you know, a different, you know, on opposite side of the war, we both felt that we were victims of much larger political uh, agendas. Um, I've received letters from church groups, from, um, uh, I guess, synagogues, uh, from um, a mother who's a woman in Utah saying that, you know, this is a book about um, the unbreakable bond between uh, um, a parent and uh, a child. So I guess um, I, when it comes to describing my novel, my work, I leave it up to the reader, each and every one of, um, of the readers. Thank you for your time. Nice to meet you. Um, so a lot of the discussions we've had about um, 
Cambodia and obviously your novel, they all deal with the past a lot. So my, my, my question more um, asks about the sort of present day situation in Cambodia. And uh, me and my group were wondering, um, who is running the country of Cambodia today? And um, are there any people that were once part of the Khmer Rouge who hold positions of power and authority in the current Cambodian government? Well, I think you've been doing list, uh, research on the history of Cambodia. Um, uh, these are very uh, pointed questions. Um, uh, the situation in Cambodia today has to be divided into two parts. Um, the Cambodian through the perspective of an ordinary citizen, the, the, as seen through the lives of ordinary citizens, and Cambodia through the perspective of, of those who, um, uh, who hold the power. Um, uh, the, the first perspective, um, uh, through the perspective of ordinary citizens, is a very hopeful Cambodia in the sense of um, there is so much hunger to to progress, to move forward, to to um, uh, you know for for however you know you see it as 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 good or bad, there is the need from from. Uh, the ordinary uh, Cambodians themselves to to just um, let go of of the shadow of genocide for a while and 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 run and try to to catch up with the rest of the world and that's through education through um, through through art through business through you know you 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 go to Cambodia now and you feel. There's this hunger to learn, to absorb, to take advantage of all the wonderful things that the present has to offer. Um, and so you, you see young people be very curious, um, uh, feeling that, um, but, you know, uh, you, they can't completely depend on, on the government uh, completely, but their own happiness, their own uh, progress must uh, depend also uh, in, uh, in a large part on their their strive forward to, to achieve um, whatever goals that they find for themselves. So I think that's very hopeful. Um, the Cambodia, if you look at the, through the lens of um, uh, or, 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 uh, you know, in, in, in the background, I guess, of those who rule it, it can be disturbing, it can be um, uh, disheartening because uh, it is one of the most corrupted countries in the world. Um, it's one of uh, the poorest you um, it's a country where the um, uh, human um, trafficking is, 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 is really something to be alarmed about. Um, I, I think, you know, part of the tribunal being what it is, is that the Leaders who are on trial are those very old and very sick. Those who are young um, have been incorporated into the government. Um, and so um, it depends on who you speak to, but I think what is uh, clearly um, evident to me is that the country is in the hand of um, very few powerful people, and not only 
it's a get in the hands of a oh, few very powerful people that are all in the same family through marriage and, and so forth, and their power has um, uh, has been strengthened over the last decades by the intermarriage, and it is a very conscious choice. Um, uh, there's uh, but Prime Minister Hun Sen was himself uh, a Kremush cadre, but defected early on during the uh, to, to to Vietnam um, to, in I guess uh, midway through through the regime. So um, uh, you know that can answer a lot in terms of uh, the state of uh, of Cambodia right now. Personally, for me as a writer, I feel that whenever I go back to Cambodia, there's this unbroken love that I have for that place and its people. But also, there's this, un, uh, this, this fear that I have of the place that even as an American citizen, I cannot rid of myself of the fear that this is a place that can explode and implode anytime into chaos, into violence, into war, and into revolution. Um, and I think um, the, the, the greatest hope I place is in uh, in, in, in the people themselves and, and their, their hunger for education and their fierce determination to, 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 to be educated, not only you know, in terms of learning in the classroom, but to, to be connected with the world, to understand what's going on. And, and, and so when I feel uh, a sense of desperation looking at the, the political situation in Cambodia, I try to think uh, of that, that there's enough people that want something better for this place. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Redner. I'm Andrew. I'm Andrew. Um, Andrew, yeah. Um, there have been many fact-based books on the Cambodian genocide, and your novel, novel is steeped in Cambodian culture and attempts yes. to reenact real-life events through this novel. Uh, my question, though, is why did you choose to tell the story through the novel medium with an omniscient presentation and a medium that is often affiliated with imagination and illustrative description as opposed to extremely personal and conservative to the detailed memoir. Um, when I set out to, you know, the, the, the story had, um, had always uh, lived inside of me and as young as that child when I was going through the experience, I was aware that one day if I survived this whole deal, I would have to uh, give a reason for my survival. I was, um, you could say that among the, those least expected uh, to, to survive my polio, um, I was uh, not a person uh, you know, that you would imagine could, could, could weather through, through this. And so that idea of my own survival and the burden that it came with it, um, the, the question of why I lived and so many others died, really plagued me throughout um, my, uh, my, my grown up life. Um, and, um, but the idea of, of writing. Uh, a memoir didn't sit well with me to, to have the focus so much on my life, my own questioning about my 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 survival. Um, didn't didn't sit well with me because I while it was a burden, I also felt that it 
was a great, great gift, you know, even if it was in some way very arbitrary, my spiral. And I, when I went back to Cambodia, even in America, the people hear a story like mine. They said, oh, wow, you know, you should write a memoir. You should write an autobiography. You've lived an amazing life. You've achieved, you know, you've achieved so much. Um, you know, you constantly fed this. But then when I went to Cambodia, I realized that what I had been able to achieve is really unremarkable compared to the lives um, of those back in Cambodia. Their daily struggle um, to, to survive, to live uh, another day under not only the shadow of, of genocide, but, you know, uh, through such um, poverty and such, uh, you know, under the threats of such violence. Um, I, it, you know, I had this kind of epiphany that, you know, if I write a book, I really, really want to honor the spirit of, of, of survival, of the, that, that spirit that through its um, stubbornness, through, through its willfulness, want to, to fight this battle um, no matter what. And I come to think that this is not particular, I came to think that this, this, this is not particular to Cambodia. That you could look at um, uh, the Holocaust back in, you know, World War II. You could look at the Rwandan um, uh, tragedy. You could look at, um, uh, you know, what happens in, in other uh, parts of the world. And, uh, and you see that the human will, you know, to, to survive, to, to conquer, um, uh, 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 in humanity, I wanted to write a book that that honors that, and I feel that the best way to honor that is to step out of my own solipsistic concerns and um, pondering, and really try to um, address a, a much broader human question, human experience, and journey. And um, fiction, I feel, is the um, allows me that that freedom. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, and, and this brings our questioning to an end. Yes. Uh, we might have gone yes. on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we might have gone on a little longer than we uh, planned for, and thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it uh, tremendously. I didn't notice the time at all. Right. And this is, uh, it has been wonderful. And thank you so much for um, preparing so thoroughly with, with this. Uh, it's, um, uh, I, I feel very honored by your attention and your attentiveness uh, to, to this work. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, with, uh, the last thing is uh, we're going to have uh, one of our students coming and thanking you personally. But before we end the session, I have a question, and that is, uh, are you writing another book? Yes, I am. I'm in the middle of it, actually. Um, it's my second novel. Um, I, I'm trying to be as brief as I can. It's, um, I, you know, my banyan addresses the questions of atrocity and, and how to, uh, you know, the, the, the character's journey uh, navigating through that uh, landscape of, of loss and, and tragedy. The um, second novel um, asks the questions of what happened when you made it through, what happens to the, to the survivors. Um, as in the shadow of Banyan, poetry weaves its way through the book in the second novel, uh, it will be music, and we'll use music to address the question of um, survival, of atonement, and reconciliation. Um, so hopefully it will work. <laughs> it sounds fascinating, and the fact that the two books are going to be linked up. Yes, yes, but um, but the, the next book is 
not uh, the, the PLJ will be told through um, the uh, alternating perspectives. One, uh, right now I'm trying to inhabit actually um, uh, the character of uh, uh, a 65-year-old um, um, half-blind musician as well as a young um, uh, American Cambodian woman. Uh, they, these two survivors have led parallel lives, and the question is, what happened when their parents descend? Thank you very much. Wish you all the best for that novel. And thank with you. that, uh, we, I'm inviting one of our students to come in and thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scotty uh, Ratner. Hi, my name is Adela. I'd like to thank you on behalf of our class. Our entire human rights history class feels honored to have been able to read your novel. It connected us to Cambodia's recent past and the atrocities of the Khmer Rouge revolution better than anything else could have. In the shadow of the Banyan was striking and beautiful and absolutely devastating. We all benefited from the story you created. McMaster University appreciates you being here today. The Department of History cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your thoughts with us. Every individual in this room today has been moved by you, Ms. Ratner. It's been a pleasure to meet with you, and we've, been hum we've all been humbled by your visit. Congratulations on your successful debut. Thank you. So thank you once again, and and uh, till the next time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye.